One, two, three, four. This is John Deddy, a fellow Southern California raised left handed metal shredder. John has played drums for the iconic bands Slayer, Anthrax, Testament, Evil Dead, Iced Earth, Heathen, and many others. I discovered John at the Soundwave Festival in Australia a few years back. I was playing with Duff McKagan's Loaded. This festival was a traveling circus of the best bands in the world on several stages, hitting all the major points around the continent. A few days in, I heard about this dude who was playing drums for both Anthrax and Slayer for the entire tour, and I didn't believe it. That is, until I ran into him between shows on a shuttle and saw his hands all bloody and bruised. After checking out both band sets for the next few days, I was sold. This dude was an animal with absolutely no fear. A true inspiration of setting goals, hard work through repetition, ultimate focus, and living out your dream. His style was super aggressive and emotional, with no triggers on the kit at all. This is something very common in today's metal records. Keep in mind, John had zero rehearsals with either band for this festival. He tapped into his muscle memory from all the records he memorized when he was younger. I found it interesting that his first double bass kit was formed through his parents' divorce. He got one kit from his dad and one from his mom, and he literally just put them together. He was already deep down the metal portal and went on to teach himself by listening to his favorite metal records. I love metal myself, but I'm definitely not a metal head. I was a new wave head. However, I'm always inspired by the masters of our instrument because you can always learn something and steal fills and styles no matter the genre. And John is a metal master. In this interview, not only does John school me on metal history, we talk about health, fitness, nutrition, recovery, drum techniques, including custom accessories around his kit, having a positive mindset, and the joy of living his dream job. John has a legendary story. I caught him poolside out in the Nevada desert to talk about it. Uh, uh, hopefully, I, is that waterfall uh, really loud in the background? Is it? That's, is it's it, not a green screen? No, it's That's not. It's the real thing? It's very cold and dreary here in Summerlin, Nevada, mm -hmm. as you can see. You know, everybody's uh, bundled up, 30 below. Yeah. Man, I wish yeah, I was horrible. Like homeland. I'm, you know, I'm a gigantic Raider fan, so I want to be in Summerlin, Nevada. Yeah, it's not, it's, it's, it's beautiful out here, man. I love it. Although I just got back from California visiting my family last week, and uh, I got to tell you, I, I, it was 84 degrees the entire weekend, uh, and it was amazing out there, too. So uh, I guess not a bad uh between the two options, not 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 a bad uh, not a bad problem to have. Oh man, thanks for the yeah. background. You brighten yeah. up brighten up the Northwest forest. It's just dreary as usual. Yeah, yeah. So um, did you grow yeah, up in man. California? I did. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I grew up in uh, Encinitas, uh, San Diego area. It's about about thirty minutes north of uh, downtown San Diego. Um, little surf town. Yeah. That's not so little anymore, but yeah. I'm That's an where I grew County. up. I'm an Orange County guy. All right. That's a little north. I think we were born about two days apart. Which is great. Really? Yeah. We have a lot, are of, you, a lot in common. Yeah. Are, are you before me or after me? Two days after. All right. Yeah. All right, Junior. Let's settle <laughs> down. <laughs> this is really cool. Um, 
You know, I've, I've been, so the purpose of the channel is uh, last year I got, like I told you, I got in a bad car accident. Come, I was playing with Roger Fisher of Heart and yeah. flipped my van in the snow. Ended up having Incredible. spine surgery. I was paralyzed for a while. Um, worked my way back. I'm at about like 70%. And uh, I'm able to teach. I'm able to play, but not like I was, you know. And when right. I watch, watch you play now, I'm just like, good. Mm. Like I miss... You know, I was never like I never played like the metal that you played, but I just I like miss the, the those muscles functioning like that. And you're a very physical player, and yeah. like, that's how you inspired me. And I was first, um, well, just a little bit like I'm not a metalhead. I don't I can't go deep into the big fours, you know, catalog. I grew up on K Rock and New Wave and '80s, you know, synthy synthy stuff. And I did start playing mm -hmm. pretty early, around 14. Um, but it was mainly like, you know, all the new wave bands, U2 and Simple Minds and Missing Persons. And that's how I got introduced to Terry Bozio and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But, um, you know, playing with Duff over at Soundwave, that's how I like discovered like, oh my God, this is like legendary stuff that's going on right now. Um, just the, the, the physicalness, um, the endurance and your hands were getting torn up and at the same time you were you know you were so excited and you were you were just you were just totally killing it and so that's what introduced me to your i didn't know much about you before that um, right just to uh want to know more about uh what you're all about because this this channel is like all about positivity you know i've been talking to a lot of uh hall of famers and heavy hitters about if they've had to deal coming back from injury while on tour or maybe they had addiction stuff or any kind of recovery overall to get back to where they were. So I've been like handpicking like all my heroes to come on and share a little bit about their background and stuff like that. That's so awesome, I, man. I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, uh, I, I guess my backstory is that, uh, God, I'll try and be as brief. I, it's, it's, uh, but, um, yeah, I, you know, I started playing drums around uh, the same age as you. I started uh, on my 14th birthday, actually. And yeah. um, I discovered uh, the first metal band I discovered. I was still 13 years old. It was Judas Priest. And uh, it was um, uh, the, the first song I ever heard was The Hellion and then Into Electric Eye. And when I when I heard that that whole guitar intro, The Hellion, it was like, man, it was like, I saw rainbows and unicorns and it was just like, what is this? It was just so me. I never heard anything like that before. And that was like my first introduction to metal. I was also in junior high school and it was the first year that I actually had a, an elective class in, uh, in, in junior high where I could actually choose, you know, something aside from just like, you know, books and stuff like that. And I chose the music class and, quickly gravitated towards the snare drum. It was just like, just the snare drum, but I knew I loved playing drums. And so when my 14th birthday was coming up, my parents were divorced and I asked my mom for a drum set and I asked my dad for a drum set. And I figured I'd get at least one out of the deal. And I wound up getting a drum set from both of them. So I got two five piece kits. So from day one, I just, and I immediately stuck them both together. So I, I started on a double bass drum set essentially. And then what was really, uh, I think, uh, it also equally important on that same birthday is my brother, my younger brother, Kevin, he got me this album for, for my birth, for my 14th birthday. He's like, you got to check this band out. This band's called Anthrax. You got to hear this record. And it was this fist coming out of this guy's face. It was a fistful mm -hmm. of metal, April, yeah. 1984. And, uh, and, and as soon as I, the first song on that record, Death Rider, I mean, then it was like really like unicorns and stuff going, at, you know, at that point. And I was, I, I also quickly discovered that as I was listening to this fast music, I, I can't tell you why or how, but I could hear what the drummer and what the drums were doing. I could, I could quickly identify, okay, he's doing this on the feet. Here's like toms, here's cymbals. I, I, I don't know how. Don't ask me how I know, but I just knew. And I hear I have this double bass drum set with cymbals and stuff, and I, I could hear what was going on. I couldn't play 95, 99% of it, <laughs> <laughs> but I could hear what was going on. Yeah, so your, your, your brain was, was absorbing it. For yeah. Later, and, later uh, and then I, and, and so the reason I'm telling you this is that that was really, the, this is how the next 
you know, four years of my life went is um, I would self teach myself first with that anthrax record. And then I quickly discovered Metallica. And then I then discovered Slayer. Yeah. And, um, you know, the thing you got to remember too, with that time frame, April of 1984, going into the summer of 1984, is that all the big four bands, they all came out well, particularly Metallica, Slayer, and Anthrax, they all came out with their debut records within six months, seven months of each other. I think uh, Metallica, they had the first, re- I think Kill 'Em All was June or July of 83. Uh, Show No Mercy, Slayer was uh, December, eight, I'm sorry, did I say 93? 83. Kill 'Em All was, 19, uh, was June, July, 1983. Um, Show No Mercy was December of 83, and I believe Fistful of Metal was either January or February of 84. Let me stop so all you of this is su- like super, super quick. Yeah. Why, as, as, as a non-obsessed metalhead, why are those the big four? Why not Judas Priest? Why not Scorpions? Why not Pantera? Why, why are those designated? Well... Uh, Judas Priest made, and I, I, I think that was, you know, technically they were, uh, well, th- those were, you know, those two bands you just mentioned are British bands. Now, Pantera wasn't really around. I mean, even though they were another type of band, probably yeah. in the late 80s, they, they formed into a, a heavy thrash band in the early 90s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was later. So, um, it's a time frame. I, you, you know, I think it's just what they called the new age of, uh, of, of heavy metal. I mean, you had I, I mean, what, what Metallica and Slayer and Anthra actually call their, their new age of metal of those British bands, some of the British bands that you mentioned. I know Metallica would mention bands like Diamond Head, uh, you know, um, bands like that. Uh, Anthrax would mention bands like Accept, you know, uh, and it, uh, maybe it was just new American bands. I, I'm not sure. But, yeah. uh, but nonetheless, they all came out around that same time frame. And, and that's what I really gravitated towards, you know, it was really a, uh, uh, Lombardo style, uh, Lars's style was, uh, I, I loved Lars's style with the snare drum and the cymbal hit, you know, accents with the snare drum and a lot of fills. I mean, that seemed to be his kind of thing. And, uh, he gets a bad rap. Well, you know, I mean, it, 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 I think more so today than back in the day. I, you know, I thought, always thought Lars was great back, uh, back in the day. I thought he had great stage presence. Yeah. Real, a lot of exciting energy, and and uh, I mean, you couldn't not be excited watching him perform back in the day. I rem- and there was a there was a gig they did, I think it was the Black Album tour, where he had two drum sets on stage, and I'm like, it was like somewhere in the middle, they're playing Four Horsemen, and there's that breakdown in the middle where it goes dun da da dun da da dun da da dun da da da. That motherfucker. After playing for an hour, and I mean, they did. They had no opening band. That that little fucker, <laughs> after after going off on this kid over here, goes up on the stairs, runs across the ramp on the top, goes back down, gets to the other kit before coming in. Like da da da, and I was like, holy shit, man! I'm like, there's CrossFit right there. Lars was doing CrossFit training <laughs> yeah. before CrossFit was even invented. So, hey, Lars, one up on you there, buddy. Yeah. That was awesome. But um, yeah, I, I, I just um, going back to you know why I was telling you about those bands in the time frame is that that really was how I developed my style and and what I gravitated towards and you know uh, you know I've always said I, I'm I'm not a drummer I, I appreciate all styles of music um, and it's really kind of a you know this might be a shock to some people I rarely listen to metal these days. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's something I might, I, I listen to it when I'm working out in the gym. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't, you know. I don't listen to music at all. I listen to sports talk or like white noise. Like, yeah, I rarely get like really inspired anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I, I love classic rock. I'm, I'm like, a, you know, I'm listening to like Bob Seger or journey or Chicago or, uh, you know, bands like that where I just, yeah, I just, it's just kind of my vibe now, you know, but I'll, 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 I, I've been in the gym. I, Megadeth T cells has been my go-to and uh, some old priest has been my go-to when I'm working out in the gym. So, but other than that, yeah, like I said, I'm a classic rock guy, but, but I, as I said, I really gravitated towards the whole, um, 
thrash metal style of drumming and that's really you know and i self-taught myself so these bands would come out with a record and that was my my learning material so 1984 it was you know i learned the entire kill em all record i would learn the entire show no mercy record and then i learned the entire fistful of metal record so this period and then, i just want to interrupt just a little bit and yeah i don't want to take a sharp left turn and i don't want to get too personal but i i do think we have a lot of similarities and i can edit out anything you don't want to easily but yeah, I, go ahead. I, I come from a twice divorced twice divorced family and but what i did have is a lot of time alone with a drum kit um with what you'd call like i guess sanctuary you know and i would just dive in after yeah. school and just really pour it out and i too am not um you I've, I've heard you mention um there's metal drummers who really rely on triggers and you're more of a you're you're a hard hitter you're more of an emotional guy and that's you developed your style through that mm -hmm. do you think um that through as a kid through those experiences that you were able to pour out your emotion into the kit and that kind of developed that style from from what was going on at the time well uh, are you asking me if uh, the experiences i was having as a kid i was taking it out on the drums yeah sadness <laughs> anger how do i deal with this I, I finally have this thing that i'm starting to get better at i have an outlet yeah well like a lot of teenagers that come from a you know family we're all just you know trying to navigate the ruby at that time you know yeah. um i know i certainly was and uh certainly wouldn't have been doing um but drumming was definitely one of my releases i i guess you know the 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 benefit or the plus of my parents being divorced uh was that as particularly with my dad my dad was uh, in sales and so you know back in the 80s uh, he was he was out on sales trips you know there's no internet there's no uh, there's no cell phones or anything although he did have that he had one of those big Gordon gecko you know <laughs> big freaking mondo cell phone things I think in the car yeah. and stuff like that but but he was always gone yeah and so I would I, I mean I was really bad in school, man. I just, I, I would ditch class all the time and I'd go home and I just want to play drums. I knew my dad was gone. And so, and I had the drums set up in the living room. I didn't even set up in the garage. I said, I took over the fucking entire living room. <laughs> oh, so, hey, can we cuss on this thing? By the way, oh, is this yeah. like, it's is this pretty, PG? Okay. I have a button right. click going so, explicit. Yeah. All right. I just want to make sure. Cause I, I, I'm known to drop F bombs. Sorry, yeah. buddy. Um, so, uh, but I, you know, free reign of the house, and especially, you know, when summer vacation came around, my God, man, that, that, but it was great because I would just play drums all day. Now, yeah. here's the thing about, I, I, I don't know if it was really so much, you know, pouring out or anything like that. I will say what I do remember about playing so heavy, it really came from, it came from ignorance to be, um, and I say ignorance in the fact that I had no concept of mixing or or levels of, of recording. And so when I would listen to these records and just hear the drums so freaking loud and the tom rolls and all that stuff just sounding so prominent and 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 kind of like right at the front of the mix, I was like, oh, okay, well, in order to make the drums sound like that, you have to hit heavier. And I had no idea that you could just kind of lay back and let a let a sound engineer or or recording kind of take that that level over. So that's really how I developed my style. Because when I eventually started jamming with people, I couldn't hear myself in a loud room. So I'm like, okay, well, just hit harder. Yeah. And um. And I remember. I it's interesting because I I of all bands I saw Anthrax. It was right before they released Persistence of Time. They were doing a little pocket show at the Troubadour in uh, in West LA. So the early 90s, it was like just a couple weeks before Persistence Drop. And, and I remember a club and, and I'm watching Anthrax play out in, out in the front and it's just loud and heavy and just this amazing sound. But in that club, you can actually walk to the side of the stage at where there were stairs to go on the stage and it was behind where the kind of array, you know, speaker system is. And I remember walking to the side and I could I just have a clear sight of Charlie playing. And Charlie was just kind of, 
you know, he was, and I did Charlie hits really hard, but, but he was just kind of grooving along and kind of tapping. I was like, wait a minute. I was like, and I'm sitting there watching just like, I, it's because out front, it sounded like, just like, Oh God, yeah. he must be just slamming the fuck out of those things. But he's just back there just, and I, and so I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> so then I would walk back to the front during the song and it's just boom, boom, boom. It's just loud. And I'm just feeling that kick drum just hitting me right here. And then I walk to the back. It's just like, oopa, oopa, oopa. yeah. <laughs> and, and that was my first concept of uh, a microphone uh, uh, and, and, and how that affected, uh, you know, the level of someone's playing. But I had already been playing with the with that perception that I needed to hit at that. The, 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 I guess the style of hitting heavy was already ingrained in me at that point so which i'm not complaining about at any at all because I, I love that i i do not rely on triggers um if i if i'm out with anthrax anthrax does like using triggers to blend the sound for their for their mix um but as far as my uh my monitors go i i take all of that out i don't want any of that in my in my from my end so anything that's coming out of my yeah, uh, zero drums. I'll say super loud guitars, zero drums every show. <laughs> Maybe a little. Kick. Oh well, no. I, I mean, I love a good, love a good sound. A, a good. I, I love hearing my drums just like mm. they're hearing them out there. Mm. But I want it to be all me. You know, I, I love having you know a really good drum mix in my uh, in my wedges and in my sub and and then yeah, I get guitars, just a little bit of bass and a little tiny bit of vocals. Um, you know, because my ear will, if, if the singer fucks up, man, I, my, my ear wants to follow the singer and uh, <laughs> that could be a yeah. disaster. Whoopsie daisy. Yeah. Uh, but it's as interesting. Far as, we, uh, yeah. as far as, yeah, we were just talking about with triggers and, and style of play, even though it sounds big from the audience. Most of the tours I've been on has been like alternative rock stuff, you know, and I'll hear, I'll be listening to mm -hmm. a pop band and the drummer is just going for it. He's got gigantic sticks. He's 200 pounds. He's using the butt end of the stick. And, you know, and, and the song yeah. is just a pop song, you know, and it's like, and it's the snare drum is like crushing my skull. And it's just like way too much, buddy. Like no one's getting a promotion yeah. here. Like th this yeah. is a moment where you can actually listen to the band, you know, and then there's, right. like, there's the opposite where you, you're hearing this giant metal fast thing going on. And it's like, they, they're, they're probably not hitting very hard, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, you know, you got to play for the for the music and for the song, right? And and uh, I, I mean, overall with thrash, I mean, it's just kind of a staple that it, more often than not, you can have that hi hat open. You can, you know, you don't have to have a, a tight hi hat. You can you can have that really loud snare most of the time. But I will say that dynamics are as equally important in metal uh, as any other style of music. You know, it's really what's going to differentiate. Um, I think a, a drummer's style is that they can pull those dynamics off in a fast environment. Yeah. Um, you know, again, I, I go to guys like um, uh, like Lombardo. You know, um, it, it, he, he it's you know most of the Slayer fills that you hear. You know, he's he's really it kind of. I mean, he's got Dave's got amazing dynamics, but like two of the staples of of his style that i if someone were to ask me like what's kind of the uniqueness of the slayer sound that dave does it's really like one two three four you know where where the accent is just on the one two three four yeah. or bop 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 and and any those are the accents and uh but it's it's with those those real fast single stroke you know so or um, and and it's really important, you know, because if you're just going ga, 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 and there's no dynamic in there, mm -hmm. changes the changes the dynamic. And uh, and it, like I said, for bands even like Slayer, where it's just you know ferocious and just brutal going for you, I mean, there's dynamics going on in there, and it's uh, it's really important, you know, Con even something. Those... Oh, yeah, sorry. go ahead. I was going to say concerning like patterns, you talked a little bit about um, some of the records that when you you were crossing over and the stuff that inspired you to, to be a better player. Were there certain um, techniques or patterns um, that you came across when when you were really diving in, trying to be a better player, that um, 
you you advanced yourself just by by practicing these certain things you discovered whether it be a kick drum pattern a hand pattern or maybe the way you hold the stick well one of the things that i i i, I I'm, nothing comes to mind off the top of my head other than you know double bass patterns and stuff uh quads Mm-hmm. quads was a bit when i got quads i was oh my god i i, I, I couldn't <laughs> sit on a drum set i just so happy that i could do a quad just sit there and, you know when i was trying to learn a quad I, it was like steve martin and the jerk you know it's like you know yeah and then i finally got it and then i couldn't then i couldn't fuck up a quad to save my life it was like really, like my brain got it it wouldn't even let me fuck it up I think really because it's such an intense physical style of music, what I really discovered was learning how to balance my body's energy and then really incorporate a fitness lifestyle into, uh, into my drumming and, and essentially treat my drumming like an athlete would their sport. Once I grasped that, that's what catapulted my drumming. Um, and touring as well but i mean touring to a degree is really it's kind of like advancing you know you're 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 increasing your physical um you're increasing your playing well yeah but you're playing at like full 10 five nights a week as opposed to if you've never toured before maybe you're going into a rehearsal room with the guys maybe you maybe your band's playing a gig once a month or once a week you're playing full out one and a half hour sets four or five nights a week um, there's just still around it. You're, you're, and really your muscles are getting stronger. Your tendons are getting stronger. Your breathing's getting stronger. I, and so all of that, and at least for me, it advanced me, but what I would do far before I ever, uh, played professionally, I remember, well, two things, I'll tell you two things right now that, that helped me. I would always play to music. So I would wear a headset and I would play to, at that time it was records. Um, eventually CDs, but I would put the record player on. I had those big can princess little looking head headphone head, you know, headset on. And, uh, you know, I put in a song like, uh, like rain and blood and I'm sitting there trying to play rain and blood and, you know, and it's going into the double bass, like in the first chorus or second chorus. And of course, halfway into the, into the chorus, my shins are on fire up on my feet. All the muscles are just burning like crazy. And, you know, my feet are just going, it's not even double bass anymore. It sounds like the Harley Davidson at that point. It's just going, pop, 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 right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the important thing was, is I pushed through, even though, and, I, and, and again, it's just like working out, you know, all those, all those guys that are in great shape. You, you, you see them like when they're, when they're lifting weights in a gym. And every single one of them will tell you that when you're, when you're lifting weights in a gym, it's always going to be those last few reps, you know, when the guy's making the funny face and he's grunting real, he's like, eh, you know, he's like trying to, you know, if he's bench press, he's like barely making it up. Yeah, yeah. And you know, that's when they're growing. It's not when they're sitting there just pushing weight like this. It's those last little ones where they're, the muscles fatiguing. I didn't realize that at 16, 17, 18 years old. Um, but that's what I was doing. So in a way it was almost like I had a personal trainer by, by pushing my, you know, listening to the music, because I, I, it's not just me jamming by myself in a room. I actually have the excitement of the music, and I can really get into it. But it pushed me through, and then eventually, all of a sudden, the Harley Davidson. It only started, at, you know, it, you know, it was a, I, I'd get a little bit further, and then until the Harley Davidson kick drums started, and then a little bit farther, and then a little bit farther. Um, there was one song I was determined to get all the way through. This is, this is a good one. It was uh, uh, Metallic Dire Z, yeah. 1988, and I was well into working out at that point, and I was so determined that I was going to get through that entire song, and and uh, and so I started jogging. I would go to the beach, and I would start running on the beach, and then I'd go, you know, then I'd go back, and I'd I'd see if I can, you know, I figured that might help me. Still couldn't get through. And then I'm like, okay, I, I'm going to start jogging in the deepest of the sand, you know, like where it's like the sand and not part on the, you know, where the water comes up or the sand's a little more compacted. Yeah. And I, and I ran, I remember running in the deeps for a week 
And then I sat down and I, cause I'd always like, like, you know, dear mother, dear father, or quit my wings before I learned to fly. It was like right at that part where the Harley Davidson case came in. And, um, and sure enough, I got through it. And I was like, yeah, all right. So, uh, you know, again, it's it, to, to do style of music. There's a very physical element of it. And that said, the more, you increase your physicality as a, in addition to your drumming technique, yeah. you're going to, in my opinion, you're going to progress further in the style of music. I'm not saying that's for everybody. There's certainly drummers that don't, but I've just found that to be true. And, um, you know, and also at the age of, uh, right age of 50, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, yeah, I'm happy to right. say, I, I, you know, no physical ailments, no car tunnel, no arthritis, you know, I have, I'm, I'm as healthy now as I've been in my twenties. So, uh, and you're that already comes from a, a good a solid drummer, physical. Yeah. If you're a metal drummer, you're already crossfitting. Um, and I think the more you, um, prepare yourself, the more you make that a lifestyle, you know, the more you'll further your career. I think the more yeah. stronger your playing will be. When, when I was learning to play, I was heavily into football. I was actually a heavy dude. I played linebacker in college. Um, but I remember, you know, back in the day, I just developed this, you know, the, the strenuousness of it. When I would practice at home, I would put on two hooded sweatshirts. I would have wrist weights on. I'd make the room as hot as possible. Yeah. And I would set the kid up like in an almost an impossible way where the toms were tilted in a weird way. So I couldn't get around the kit easily. It's like I'm, I was preparing for the worst case scenario when you get to a venue that maybe they have a house kit or maybe the sound guy doesn't give a shit. Or whatever you, you right I'm just preparing uphill all the time everything's uphill so when i get on my kit that's set up exactly the way i want it and the show is perfect it's like it's easy you know i treat it i look yeah. at it more like a training yeah and you know it, it, it's funny you mentioned that about uh, kit setup too because that was the other thing that i was really big on is i um uh, i i would set my kit up i would mirror my kit set up the way that you know was really i think lars's kit that i that i mirrored in like the master of puppets uh and justice for all era um you know symbols kind of lower i did have a ride symbol i didn't you know lars bailed to ride there for a while but i uh i, I you know and and charlie's set to you know charlie was kind of a, his setup seemed to change a little bit um but i again i'm i'm I had the thought process of, okay, well, they're playing these fast songs this way. Well, if I have a symbol that's like way up here and they don't, and they're trying to do this fill, maybe that's going to prevent me from doing that fill. Like hmm. they would do it, you know, or it would be a lot more work or maybe it would be impossible to do it, you know, but by having a China type, like down by the ride symbol, it makes more sense. And uh, plus I just learned, I think over the years too, of, you know, I, I, I kind of keep my kit more like a low rider setup. Yeah. Your toms because, are pretty tilted. Uh, yeah, tilted a little bit and then the cymbals are pretty low. I I I I I I would honestly I would put my cymbals even lower, but I I I I you know, sound engineers seem to have an issue with them being too low and I kind of take that into account. I mean, I don't want to fuck up a show because uh, you know, I want a cymbal here as opposed to here. It's like I I'm not married to to it being, you know, at a at a certain level I, I mean there's there's certainly wiggle room there so yeah but I, I think by by having them lower as opposed to higher I think kind of you know puts a lot of stress on the shoulders and um I just found it worked better for me but um the other thing I was telling you too I go ahead oh I was gonna say it's it's a, very interesting because I was talking with uh, Martin Chambers of the Pretenders he was my first guest um and he would set his symbols up almost as far away as possible because he wanted he wanted more of an animated um, movement on stage and I, I played the blue man group mm -hmm. for, for a little bit back in the years and they everything was about playing for the people who are in the very back of the arena they're huge shapes everything has to be huge shapes and it really goes against anything about make drum make sure the drummer is as comfortable as possible it's like the exact yeah opposite. which is yeah, really well, where you want to be if you're in a rock band you want your kit set up exactly not like your hero, but exactly as comfortable as you want it. Well, yeah. I mean, you want it comfortable. You want to, you know, obviously there's, there's, you know, everybody's going to have their element of how, you know, 
I guess, flashy they want to be or, or how much of a performance they want to give. Um, I never really got into the stick twirling and all that yeah. stuff. I'm like, you know, dude, I'm, I'm busy, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I've got uh, notes to hit. I've got 64th note triplets. Yeah. To I'm, a, I'm a little, I'm a little busy back here, but yeah. I also, you know, I, I think it's just more of an intensity, you know, just my, my, my perception when I come on stage, you know, they, you know, um, it, you know, it, it's almost like, like, I guess like a fighter walking into the ring, you know, that's how I really treat it. it, it just cause it's, it's, Fucking, I'm getting ready to get some shit on, man. You know, it's like fuck. Playtime's over, guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, we're we're not we're not playing John Mayer here. Um, <laughs> but uh, but what I was gonna say also about energy that I found what, a technique that I uh, that I that I adopt to this day, and it really helps a lot on stage. Is uh, well, kiddos in the pool yeah. back there. <laughs> yeah. I'll try and watch the F-bombs here. Um, You've been kind of choppy so, uh, for like one 10 of the techniques minutes, really... but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang in there. It's, it's, it, I think it's still choppy. watchable. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to, I mean, we can try to, if you wouldn't mind, I can try to resend you another thing or we could just power through. What's, uh, what's it doing? Is it, uh, is it, is it? It's kind of like your, uh, I kind of get you, it's, you're kind of like doing um, uh, claymation. Oh. Your vote, your, your audio is fine. It's just weird. We okay. See, we'll press on. Okay. Energy. All right. Um, well, what I was going to say is that, uh, uh, it, I, what I will do, what I found is, uh, and, and this is really for double bass, um, single kick drum patterns. I will use my right foot. I will, I will, I will give my left. I'm a, I'm a lefty by the way. Yeah. So I don't know if you noticed that I, I, yep. so, so a lot, you know, obviously left foot is, uh, I, I never like to say my left foot is my primary foot, but yes, I do use my left foot more than my, than my right. But when I'm doing single kick drum patterns, I will try to use my right foot, uh, in w with, a with a pattern. And the reason I do that two feet, you know, you're going to be doing fast double bass. But if you just have one foot over here, right, and it's doing all the single work, and then this foot's just sitting on a hi-hat pedal. Yeah. Well, two things are happening. This foot is cooling down. If we think of it like a workout, it's not getting a lot of like, – it's just sitting there. Yeah. And then your primary foot, whether you're left or you're right, is doing all this work in single patterns. And now you got to go into a double bass pattern. And now that left foot or your right foot, whichever is your primary foot that's been doing all that work single, now it's got to go really fast. And it's already a little fatigued from doing left pattern stuff. Now you're bringing the right foot in, which is cooled down because it's just pretty much been sitting on a hi-hat stand. So what I will do, I'll give my left foot a break and just simple simple patterns, you know, just boop, 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 instead of doing it on my left foot. You can see this in some some videos, by the way. I'll just start using my right foot. Yeah, gives my left foot a little break, gives it a chance to cool down. It keeps the blood flow, keeps my right foot kind of warmed up. So when it comes time to go into the double bass stuff, boom, you, you have a little more uh, even distribution of power and rest in both your feet, which will allow you to be powerful with the double bass. Um, even Angel of Death, perfect not, example. Not just rehearsing. Oh, always in shows. Yeah. Predominantly in shows. Okay. Angel of Death, you know, that whole solo part, it's just boop up, boop up, boop up, boop up. It's a single kick drum. So the Hanneman part of the solo, I do left foot, and then the next part, that's boop up, boop up, boop up, boop up, I'll be all on my right foot because I'm on the right symbol. And then the next part, left foot, and then the next, that next section, right foot. And then boom, double bass and the double bass solo part is, is, is there. Now, if I was doing that entire solo part with my left foot and that right foot's just sitting on the hi-hat the whole time, well, I'm sure I'll still pull it off, but it's, it's just, you know, I'm distributing and conserving my energy more evenly by doing it the way I just uh, suggested and the way that I do do it. It's almost like think think like a football field, you know. It's like think if you just you, you could walk with both feet across a football field, you're using both sides of your body evenly, 
or you can hop on one foot across the field, you know, pick a leg. I don't care which leg it is. You know, you hop on one leg, which yeah. is going to distribute, which is going to be easier at the end. You know, I'm going to say that walking, just regular walking with two feet is going to be a lot easier than hopping on one foot and, uh, or hopping to the 50 yard line and then sprinting the rest of the way. <laughs> they sound like some old college drills I used to do. Right. But I, I guess that's what I'm saying is that, you know, you're, you're by, by giving, look, you're, you're doing an hour and a half set. It, it, and, and you're trying to put, you know, not only cause you're not just playing your drums, you're performing. Right. So you're going to be using a lot more intensity in a live situation. So that said, why not, you know, use little tricks that are going to help conserve your energy out front. They're not going to know the difference. I mean, there's, what's the difference if it's a left foot or a right foot doing a single kick drum pattern? It's yeah. not, you know, nobody will know. You'd never know if I, if I just told you, unless I just told you. <laughs> exactly. So, so, so yeah. Put in. Yep. Yep. So, but those are the two techniques that I would take away from it. Of my, okay. Sorry for my long winded answer there. No, no, it's all good. So I did want to touch, uh, you know, with the, with the channels based around and the physical maintenance and, diet and, yeah. and lifestyle and stuff. But before that, um, just to flash back to Soundwave a little bit. Um, so I'd never been to Australia before, be, before we did that festival. And there was so much cool stuff that happened. And I know you were ramping up, you were excited because you were going to play with both bands every night. It's going to be a marathon. And I was wondering, like, for me, yeah, man, you know, Metallica, the very first night they had, they had this barbecue with an open bar and all the bands were there hanging out. And then, uh, at the hotel, I remember hotels. Um, we were walking around. You know that band Ghost. We were walking around mm -hmm. with them in there. You know, and they didn't have any of their stuff on. At the time, I didn't know much about them, but it's like I looking back, I'm like, should have should have spent more time hanging out with those guys. Um, watching uh, Garbage's set with the drummers of Offspring and and uh, Adam Willard from Danko Jones is really cool. Um, I got to chat with Corey of Slipknot a little bit and Brooks of Blink One Eighty Two. And actually, Lars, I got to talk with him a little bit because he went to my same high school. Um, so oh, wow. Kind of funny. Cool. Um, but I was wondering, uh, and then <laughs> I, was in, I was in a wine shop or something. I, I, I spotted Carrie and some of the Slayer guys were in there, and I was just kind of lurking in the back, like I'm following Slayer around shopping, you know, in Brisbane. It's kind of funny. But I was wondering, if, if, on that particular festival, did you have any cool memories that pop up? Oh man. Well, <laughs> aside from the fact that I had played for two of the big four bands yeah, and, know. you know, on the same tour, um, in the same day. <laughs> yeah, that's the top. yeah. And considering that, you know, those were, you know, I, I, I've been so privileged, dude, that, um, I have been able to play for my, my, I guess my, my childhood idol bands. Right. I mean, that, going back to what I was telling you before, that how I, you know, the bands I discovered when I started playing drums, Slayer, Anthrax, Metallica, uh, Megadeth to, to a degree, um, you know, I've now had the opportunity to play for two of those bands and, uh, and then to play for two of those bands on the same tour. Um, I mean, just an, an incredible feeling. I um, Brisbane... I remember that night you're talking about, I didn't get to go to that party because I was too busy. I, I was up on stage with my tech making yeah. sure that the kit was, uh, you know, cause we were using the same kit. Uh, and I wanted to make sure everything was, you know, we had just got the kit had just arrived from the States. And so I wanted to make sure everything was fine. Cause the last thing I want to be thinking about is the kit being, you know, I just, you know, there's a lot going on. I think we could both agree. I was a little busy. And the last thing you want to be thinking about is uh, if, the, if, if the, if the drum kit is off a little bit or something like that. So yeah. I was up yeah. there with my setting everything up and uh, um, working with him on that. He did a phenomenal job, by the way. Um, shout out to Ian, my boy Ian. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, but I will say that first show when I, when I jumped up on stage with, uh, with Slayer, I just remember looking over to the left and um, it was just like standing room only on, on stage left. I mean, and I, I'm looking over and it's like, I see the Lincoln Park. Yeah. Got a call coming in there. Sorry. Nope, it's all right. Uh, so the Lincoln Park so, guys. 
Yeah, and then I saw I saw my buddy Jericho, Chris Jericho was on the side, and right next to him, just staring right at me was fucking Hetfield, and I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, and I just I was like, oh fuck, man! I'm like, and he's just sitting there, just like you know, you, you know, I mean, if you see James, he's just got the glasses on, you can't yeah. really, you know, kind of like Carrie's got the poker face, can't really tell yeah. like, what what what's going, on, but he's watching and. um and I just was like, okay, well, here we go, man. Let's you see know? what you got. I mean, yeah, I, I'm just like, you know, what's the worst? Drum karaoke, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, it, 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 that was a fun first gig. And, uh, uh, I, you know, I think I, I mean, here's the thing, man, you got to remember is that we didn't even have a band rehearsal. We, there was no band rehearsal for that. I was going to ask if both bands rehearsed in LA, like if you were just like seven days a week, you were just going in and out. No, no, no. I got, I got the call uh, from Slayer less than two weeks before we left for Soundwave. Mm. And I rehearsed with Carrie, just Carrie and I in a room just to kind of go through the, uh, you know, now remember I was in the band back in the nineties and, yeah. and almost all the songs that we played were songs that I had, you know, they were all songs that I already knew. So it was really just kind of like riding a bike and, you know, just kind of giving it a, a listen through a couple of times and just, you know, and obviously Carrie wanted to be confident. Um, it's like that movie uh, Rockstar with Marky Mark. <laughs> now I'm Marky Mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, but, but it was just Carrie and I in a room. I think we jammed for three days. Yeah. And then I didn't see them because uh, uh, Anthrax had a one-off in uh, Brisbane before Soundwave started. So I had to fly, it was literally, oh God. Uh, yeah, it was a week before we actually, uh, before we, uh, before I saw them again. So it was jamming with Carrie for three days and then really five days off. And then the first time we jammed was on stage in Brisbane. Wow. So it was, uh, you know, but again, I, I was like, okay, well, it's just all the songs that I've known. The only song that we played that I'd never jammed with them on stage before was Disciple, the opening song. Um, all the other songs I'd, I'd done with them in the past. So I had a pretty good foundation on it. And, uh, but yeah, I just remember everybody watching on the side of the stage. And then I, they couldn't change my flights because I, I, so I had to do the Elvis literally right off stage from Brisbane with Slayer to the airport because um, they couldn't change my flight. And I had to get to the airport to be on the flight that Anthrax was on to Sydney. Hmm. And I remember getting to the lounge at the airport and Jericho was there as well. I don't know how the fuck he got there. I mean, he must have left before the show was over, but uh, he was on the same flight as us. And I just remember I was in the lounge and comes up, puts his arm. And he's like, dude, you blew Hetfield away, dude. He was like, blah, 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 blah. I was like, really? Hetfield was saying that. I was like, I was like a little kid, you know, I was like, Hetfield said that about me. Really? <laughs> yeah. And uh, he's like, dude, how does he fucking do this and that and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, you know, it's just drum karaoke, buddy. Um, it, it, that was just one of the best compliments. You know, I, you know, when you get that compliment from, from somebody you truly admire in the, in, in the business and in the industry, that was probably one of the best compliments I could get was, uh, you know, hearing James Hadfield compliment my drumming like that. So that was really awesome. And then, um, God, what was, uh, I just think just the overall, just playing two, two gigs in a day, man. You know, I mean, the Sydney show that we did, the headline show was really, that was the, that was the toughie, bro. Yeah. And, um, Long set. well, it was just the, you know, the festival gigs were, you know, Anthrax was on stage, I think at like, 12 30 in the afternoon and played for 45 minutes and then i think slayer was on stage at three or four o'clock so there was a little you know maybe a couple hours in between both sets and um but the slayer headline show in in sydney was anthrax opening mm. and so that was uh you know both bands had a longer set but you know how it is i mean you do you know, support band goes on and then 30 minutes set changeover and then the headline band is on. Right. So I had, I had roughly 50 minutes on stage with anthrax, 30 minutes set changeover, and then right back on stage with, with Slayer. 
for an hour and 40, hour and so, 45. So is that nap that. time or is that, is that hydration time, stretch time? What are you doing in that period? 30 minutes, dude. Where, where am I going to get a nap <laughs> in 30 minutes? It, it took almost 10 minutes just to walk back to the dressing room, yeah. you know, and uh, dude, 30 minutes goes by like that. Yeah. And I mean, and it was also just a weird psychological thing because, you know, you, you, you play a set. And when you're done with the set, you get off stage and there's just that, that, I don't know, that psychological thing like, okay, I'm going back to the dressing room, getting out of wet clothes. I'm going to have a beer, just kind of chill down and relax. And it was, uh, you get into the dressing room and it's like, okay, well, I'll see you guys later. And I'm walking down the hall. All the anthrax guys are, you know, grabbing a beer and, you know, getting out of wet clothes and all that stuff. And I'm walking down the hall and I go into the Slayer room everybody's nobody's in a sweat they're all warming up to go on stage and i was just like oh fuck <laughs> and i had just enough time to get a uh, I had just enough time to get a uh snickers or something. Uh, an electrolyte drink no no snickers dude no no i can't do that uh it was really it was more like a, an electrolyte drink a carb drink and mm -hmm. uh and then you know obviously take off the anthrax shirt put on a slayer shirt and uh and we're we're walking the stage I mean, it was so quick and then it was like hour and 40. So yeah, I could barely, I remember trying to hold a beer at the end of the night and I'd sit there like, like this and my, my hand would slowly start sinking down like this. <laughs> I did see your hands pretty beat up, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle of that festival. What did you do to, you know, keep them together? Any, uh, powders or pain stuff? Well, I wear gloves. Yeah. Uh, the, the, you know, the massage therapist yeah. people, they gave me, uh, some, uh, some stuff. And, uh, uh, my buddy, Chris Merrick, uh, who was doing some publicity, uh, for the bands down there, he had this, uh, ointment bomb stuff that was really for tattoo guys, but, um, that helped out a lot. It was kind of like, I don't know, it was like a neosporin type of thing, but it was all organic and that helped out a lot. But, uh, yeah, it just really just the gloves are a savior, man. That's really, I, 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 um, I did my first tour without gloves and, and I, I got the worst blisters on my hands ever and, and ever since then I've, I've just been forced to wear gloves and it seems to help out a lot. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, overall the, the, the sound, I mean, dude, what a, what a great experience that was, you know, I mean, just to kind of make history like that and, uh, Legendary. and just pouring it. What's up? Legendary. Yeah. Well, just the fact, like I said, the fact that we had no rehearsals and, yeah. uh, and the fact that we pulled it off. I mean, if you watched us on stage, you know, I mean, look, I had some clams here or there. I, I, uh, if I could, you know, if I really wanted to pick my, my performance apart, I'm sure I could, oh, I went a little fast here. Oh, I rushed this part there, but, eh, you know, what am I, what am I going to over? It was organic. It was organic. Yeah. Tempo. I, I don't, I don't, you know, you make them, there's those guys that make a mistake and they get all like, oh my God, I did this, did this. And then, you know, I'm the other guy. I go, whoopsie daisy <laughs> yeah, yeah that's a good idea so uh um but yeah I, I just you know i i think from the crowd perspective if you were to watch and this is where i feel i did my job is that if you were out in the crowd watching slayer and you didn't even know that dave wasn't there i think you'd be hard you know of course there's going to be slayer fans that are going oh you know they'll disagree on this but I, I think for the most part overall i think that uh that you you know, I think we pulled it off in a way that, you know, kept the integrity of the band and the integrity of the music. And it didn't sound like some fill in guy coming in, you know? Yeah. And uh, even just watching us perform, it's like, you know, I'm very comfortable with the songs. I was comfortable with the songs. I'm not looking at people for time changes. I'm like, you know, I'm, I, I know what I need to do and I'm, and I'm doing it. And, uh, and I, and I think that really resonated on stage as well, which is important. Speaking more about, uh, you know, physical fitness and um, maintaining a healthy lifestyle these days and going forward, I think um, when I first discovered, you know, the whole sex, drugs and rock and roll um, is, is probably overrated thing was my first tour with Duff in Europe and uh, getting off the bus and I think it was Scotland and it was like eight in the morning or something and I walk into the venue and there's this there's this tall guy with a ski cap on just doing like 200 push-ups in the middle of the venue floor. You know, I was like, Oh cool. These, you know, these roadies really like to stay in shape around here. And it's like, he turns over and it's, it's like Duff. He's like constantly working out every day, keeping himself in shape, keeping himself clean. Yeah. And, um, that's, and then, um, you know, past that, you know, and I like to work out too, but he would start to grab me. Hey Burke, let's go to whatever gym, 
hey, Burke, you know, Germany or, or through the UK, let, let's go to this university. They have a gym. So I'd always be the sidekick going to work out with them. And I wanted to write like a coffee table book about working out with Duff in Europe, you know, something like that. <laughs> but did you, I know you, you discovered being physically fit pretty early on, but what is, what is your, um, and I saw a CrossFit video. Do you, are you still doing CrossFit or have, have you changed it up to um, some, some different exercises or different um, strength stuff that you're doing these days to keep yourself in shape? What's the new thing you're doing? Yeah, so it's interesting you mention that because I, I kind of bounced back and forth in the CrossFit arena, and um, uh, well, I guess I, I why not? I'll 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 drop this now. Um, so I'm getting ready to uh, work out with uh, starting. So I'm I'm going to be releasing a book next year. Cool. And just kind of like my journey to Slayer, Big Four, you know, my 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 journey in drumming. Um, but also how physical fitness, how I've, I've treated my, you know, drumming like an athlete would and the benefits of working out and kind of, you know, stories along the way and my history with that as well. Um, what I'm doing uh, is uh, next month, I'm actually uh, getting in a gym for the next six months with a, uh, with a trainer. Um, awesome MMA uh, fighter. He, he's, uh, you know, not going to really say any more than that, but I'm going to be spending the next six months uh, going through a full body transformation. Hmm. So we're going to put uh, just kind of like uh, an actor would for one of these movie roles. So we're going to be where our goal is uh, we're going to put 25 pounds of muscle on me and we're going to chisel me down to 8% body fat. So uh, like I said, that's going to be my, my thing over the next six months. And uh, that'll Are you be getting in the ring. No, 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 no fighting. <laughs> My wife no trains fighting. in uh, jujitsu, so we watch yeah, a lot no, of the MMA. No fighting, no fighting. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's going to be um, it's just going to be six months of uh, oh my god, just eating eating so much food and eating ca you know just calories and not the fun calories either. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's going to be the it's going to be the the calories that you're just going to be like oh no. But I'm doing that because I, I just, I want to go through this transformation when I release my book next summer uh, to really, you know, show, especially people that are, that are, you know, maybe they're, they, they, they were in shape, they've gotten out of shape. You know, I've bounced up and down in my fitness throughout the years. You know, I, I it's so, man, it's so easy to just get out of it and put weight on real quick. You know, you're like, yep. holy shit, man. I've only, I stopped working out for like eight weeks and I look like a freaking <laughs> Augustus get out of the chocolate. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, but, um, pretty quick. but yeah, so I just, I, you know, if I'm going to be preaching health and all that, I just, I really wanted to make a statement um, because I will be, you know, I'll, I'll be saying, look, you know, this is how I play. And, and this is for me, this is how I play the way that I do. And, uh, and so, uh, so, but to answer your question, yeah, I, I, I've been just kind of doing a basic routine for myself right now. Uh, I haven't wor been working with a personal trainer, but, uh, next month, December, we, uh, we're, we kind of start our assessment, you know, look at my body movements and stuff during doing exercises. And then, and then January it's, uh, it's on with a personal trainer, you know, uh, six months, man. It's going to be, uh, yeah, it's going to be uh, brutal, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So is that going to interfere with any uh, recordings or anything like that you've got planned? Uh, what, what do you, what's going on? Are you no. doing, is it called Mishiak? Mishiak? Mishiak. No, I haven't played with them. Uh, I just did an album with them and uh, you know, those guys are all the way in Australia. So yeah. uh it's not like I, you know, you get in the car and be yeah. right over for a rehearsal or something. It's just, there's a lot. You know, I, I thought that I could make that work in a similar way that, a, you know, Anthrax or Slayer would, would rehearse. You know, everybody flies in. Um, the difference was that, uh, you know, my, what I overlooked was that, you know, Slayer Anthrax, they've been together for decades. And for them to fly in for a couple of days is really kind of like a paint by numbers when you're rehearsing. Whereas a new band is really, you got to, there's a lot of learning you know, interacting with, with new musicians and, and there's a lot of groundwork that needs to be uh, done. And so it requires a lot more time in a, in a rehearsal room. 
yeah. I think in the beginning. So, uh, yeah, it's just too far, dude. Yeah. So, but as far as recordings go, no, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very selective man of, of, you know, how I, how I do that and, and who I'm doing it with. And I, I just, I, you know, I, I'm going to record with, uh, you know, people that I, you know, if the music inspires me, then I'll, I'll, I'll look at it. But, um, I'm just, man, I'm, you know, look, bro, I'm 50 years old. I'm, yeah. I'm not into, you know, I, I don't want to waste someone's time in a, in a startup type situation. Yep. And, uh, uh, you know, cause it's just not, it's just not realistic for me right now. I've got, I've got two, uh, you know, I guess, you know, real job type companies. I have a funding company that I have. I have a insurance brokerage, you know, I actually have real world shit that I have going on as well. So, um, not nearly as sexy as drumming, but you know, the nice thing is that it allows me the flexibility and freedom to be very picky with what I do in music. So, um, in that regard, I love it, but, uh, yeah, I, you know, I've been, uh, been toying around the fact of doing a, uh, a drum video, uh, kind of instructional course, uh, maybe do that, do a release with that next year and, uh, you know, show people how to play like Slayer, Anthrax, Metallica, stuff like that. Um, but as far as recording, there's, uh, there's nothing on the books right now. So, uh, if the right opportunity comes along, I'll, I'll definitely, uh, I'm up for a good camping trip. <laughs> Yeah, you know, tying into the the physical stuff, you, you on our chat on the phone, you, you were talking about iodine. So I'm, you know, going along yeah. with this body um, transformation you're going to go through. I'm sure you're you're pretty clued into the supplements you'll be taking as well. Um, I discovered magnesium during Soundwave because my hands were cramping up in the middle of shows, and yeah. over, overnight, just the table over the or over the counter magnesium cured it like that. Plus, I started drinking water, which is very important, um, and stop actually drinking during that tour and that cured all that stuff up so um i doubt there's going to be much alcohol consumption in your body transformation coming up too no yeah no if it is it'll be like a once in a you know if my trainer says i can have a a cheat meal you know then uh yeah. then then that's when it'll happen but yeah i'm like i said i'm gonna be uh <laughs> i'll be miserable for the next six months in that regard but uh you know, I, I think that when you focus on a goal, it, it, it's easy. I, I've always been pretty extreme in that regard. You know, I, I've been, uh, because I value my health, uh, the overall overall health. I mean, I'm not a monk by any means, but I, I value it so much that I, I'm, when it comes time to do something extreme, I can do it. Um, I actually uh, fasted mm -hmm. for 24 days about a year and a half ago. And uh, water only, no food, no juice, no supplements, nothing, just water. What? I was like a, I was like a, like, yeah, Jesus diet, dude. <laughs> water only. How'd you yeah. feel towards and, the end? And, uh, uh, like, well, I, dying? I felt amazing, to be honest with you. Oh, really? No, well, you know, you got to remember, uh, you know, your body can go for a very, very long time without food you're not going to be very happy. You, you'd probably be pretty pissed off actually, but uh, you, you can go a very long time. You can go well past. I mean, I think they say you can go 60 days without food, but you cannot go any longer than like maybe two, three days tops without water. Have to have water. It's essential. So, but I was really getting into, you know, the benefits of fasting, how it builds an, a new immune system. Uh, I would never recommend anybody do what I did as far as that, just because of, you know, I, who knows what your health concerns are, if you're taking medications and stuff like that. Um, I would never recommend anybody do it to, to the length or degree that I did it without medical supervision. But uh, I will tell you that um, I was researching benefits of fasting uh, and specifically uh, something that happens in the body called autophagy. Have you heard of that? Mm -mm. Have you heard of autophagy? So it's really, I, I think it means uh, to eat thyself. So it's essentially your body eating itself. But what it specifically is happening is the healthy cells in your body are actively seeking out the unhealthy cells in your body and eating them. So uh, it's, a, it's a really fascinating uh, 
process that happens. So it's, it's far beyond your body going into ketosis and, you know, your body using ketones for fuel. Uh, but the uh, autophagy process that happens is what really fascinated me. And so that's what I was really... Um, and you saw the results. Uh, I, 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 oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I just, uh, you know, I, all I can tell you is just research uh, fasting and autophagy. Mm -hmm. It's A-U-T-O... P H A G Y, autophagy. Yeah. So I think a doctor just got like a Nobel Prize discovering it. It wasn't that long ago, years ago. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, again, I'll, I'll do something extreme like that. And uh, so when it comes to, you know, I mean, drinking is overrated, buddy. You know, it's oh, yeah. it, it can be fun. It's social, but at the end of the day, it's, uh, um, you know, I. I can just as much as I can turn it on and have a few drinks, I, I can turn it off. No problem. It's not a, it's not really an issue for me. Um, I know it is for some people, but, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, um, like I said, I'm looking forward to the uh, transformation. We'll see, uh, we'll see how that turns out about, we can do one of these in June or July next year and see, uh, see what I look like. <laughs> Please. Let's yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hey, uh, we've been going for a while. I don't want to. I don't want to keep you forever. I have actually one little drum technical thing to ask you. Um, let me grab my yeah. beater. You might recognize this beater. So, since the spine it's surgery, our yeah. So, um, you know, I have a lot of nerve damage, and I'm what I'm missing in my my kick foot is the quick trigger stuff, and it's the nerves down the leg aren't aren't um, communicating properly. So what it feels like now is it feels like um, I'm having to drive a lot from the hip with very little, like my feet are still kind of numb. So I'm having to eat my hip and my, my butt and my thigh do all the work. Um, so what I, this was my favorite beater because it's quick and it does have that attack. But now what I need is like a heavier beater. And I'm not sure, I noticed in your, in your kick pedal video, you know, the angle that you had what your suggestions would be to make it more top heavy with, this is a 5,000. Um, yep. Um, if you know any beaters out there that might be circular, more top heavy, because I need, I need my foot to have more strength because all my strength is coming from my hip or any suggestions you would have. Cause it's just too light well, right now. Uh, all my power is coming from my hip. So the, the, the Tama, uh, have a, um, Right underneath that red wood, you know, like the, the shaft part, uh, the, the shaft part on the uh, Tama uh, Cobra beaters, mm. they come with a little uh, weight that right. goes on there. I don't know if that would give you enough, the, the weight that you're looking for, but you, I believe that that, because all those shafts are pretty much the same diameter. Yeah. So I, I would try buying or getting a couple of those, um, those Tama, it just looks like a washer, you yeah. know, with the, uh, with the nut on the end and it goes right under, it would go, it would slide, slide that thing all the way up right underneath to hit it right up to the wood part because those Tama, uh, beaters, you know, they're very, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with them or not, but the, the beater is very small. Yeah. And so they actually put a weight on there to, to give it the weight of a, of a, I guess, kind of a regular beater, but you could get a couple of those. And, and put it on there and see if that, that might make the difference for you. That's what I would recommend. Yeah, I think they actually actually say the weight on each. on each. Uh, you know, it literally just looks like a fat washer. It would just slide, it, it would just slide up and use a drum key to tighten that thing up right underneath the, uh, the, the beater, uh, right underneath the wood part of the, of, the, of the Danmar beater. That's what I would try. I'll figure that out. Yeah, I've got like five pedals with different makes. I, I'm a Mapex guy, but um, the Mapex beater is actually – better for me right now because it, it is heavier but i think i need even heavier than my heavy beater at this point while i'm healing up yeah thanks for this yeah i mean you know I, I, th maybe there's another type of beater out there i you know those damn more beaters are pretty you know top heavy yeah um you know yeah like you're saying i mean i i do keep mine hot rotted so to speak where i i, I they're, they they almost sit you know horizontal uh in a resting position because it just gives me more more space and more punch when I can, uh, you know, with each hit, but it's definitely taken, uh, you know, people will ask me, dude, does that hit your feet, the top of your feet when you have it like that? I'm like, 
Yep. But I've, I've just, it, not as much anymore. Every now and then it'll hit, but I just, I've, I've kind of mastered, I guess that, that position over the, not even years now, the decades now that I, it doesn't, it doesn't smack the top of my feet anymore. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it, 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 you know, you could try that. It, I, I keep it back like that and I keep the spring as tight as it'll go because it really helps um, in the faster, you know, doing the faster stuff. I, the pedal works more for me in the faster stuff. It's the slower stuff that it becomes, you really got to kind of mm -hmm. get a feel for it. And guys will sit on my, my, my kit. They'll be like, how do you play your bass drum pedals like this, man? And I'm like, suck it up, Junior. <laughs> <laughs> and I love the moleskin idea too. I love going down the farm. Yeah. And the moleskin. Yeah. Yeah. Moleskin definitely takes, uh, that, just kind of that, that top, you know, that, just that aggressive clank clank sound off, you know? Um, I, I learned that from Charlie actually. Charlie was, was where I discovered that he, cause we, Charlie's using it. it it's so weird. The similarities between his pedals and, and using the, the Danmar pad and me and, uh, I was doing everything that Charlie had, except I didn't have the mole skin. I was like, what's that? And, uh, and uh, it, it not only does it take the top end off, but it keeps that, that Danmar click that I use. It, 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 it's the best adhesive to keep that thing on the kick drum pedal, uh, the kick drum head as well. Yeah. So uh, yeah, they're great, man. I definitely recommend the, the mole skin. Check that sure. out. Mix and match. Hey man, I really appreciate yeah, buddy. your time. Um, this is really cool this is for, uh, it's called drum recovery network. And, um, yeah, yeah. Buddy. my, my pleasure. I'm glad it works for you, by the way, super um, important and, you know, magnesium, super important, just minerals overall. You know, I was going to tell you real quick before we go, Yeah. regardless of what type of, uh, what, what doesn't matter what type of uh, workout program somebody's on. You know, they, whether you're a bodybuilder, you're into yoga, you're a vegan, you're a carnivore, it doesn't, doesn't matter. It's, you know, I, I really look at everything as, uh, you know, think of your body like a, uh, like a, like a vehicle, like a car, you know, and, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're, uh, you know, you can take a, I don't know, what, what's a, let me think of a real nice car right now, a, a Rolls Royce Phantom. There we go. I don't know where Rolls Royce Phantom came from, but we'll go with Rolls Royce Phantom. You take a Rolls Royce Phantom and you can take a Ford Pinto, yeah. right? Clearly there's two entirely different, uh, you know, the quality of, of the Phantom just exceeds the Pinto in every way. Yeah. But both of those cars, I don't care if it's the Rolls Royce, that amazing engine and that, the, the quality and craftsmanship of that Rolls Royce or, or, the, or the crappy Pinto. They both require a certain amount of oil. They both require a certain amount of brake fluid. They both require a certain amount of transmission fluid. They both require a certain type of gasoline in that to make that engine function properly. Yep. That Rolls Royce V12 amazing uh, uh, Phantom engine takes eight quarts of probably some mobile one synthetic grade oil. And if you put, so what happens if you put you get the mobile one synthetic oil, but you only put two quarts in. Mm -hmm. And instead of changing that, mo that, that oil every 5,000 miles or whatever the you know, high mileage oil is, you change it every 15,000 miles. Well, you have that amazing car, that amazing engine. You're putting the right stuff in, but not enough of it. So, yeah. Or even worse, you decide not to get the mobile one synthetic grade and you just go to Walmart and you buy the white tub on the, on the shelf for uh, six ninety nine that just says oil. Yeah. I mean, that's been a, it's been uphill. Like, you know, when your life changes like this, there's definitely, um, I wouldn't say peaks, there's definitely valleys and then there's, you find a feel normal and there's valleys. Yeah. And during those valleys, there's this, there's a self pity shit that comes up and it's like, it doesn't matter. I'll just fill myself full of bad oil and, well, but again, it's it, it, it more more importantly, buddy. It's it's you, you you know look this 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 thing that we're in, right? It's it's got filters. It's got an engine, right? We've got an engine right here that beats. We've got we've got our lungs, our our liver, our kidneys, our you know we've got filters. Yeah. 
Yep. It's amazing to me. People will take their shit box Hyundai to a, to a Jiffy Lube to, to change the oil every 3,000 miles and get the air filters clean. And I, I will ask a simple question of, when's the last time you cleaned the filters in your own freaking body? Mm-hmm. And I just get this deer in the headlight stare. But uh, going back to, to, the, to my oil analogy is really, it doesn't matter what you're doing or what you're putting in the body. What, what I'm getting at is that, um, you know, your body requires a certain amount of, you know, proteins, fats, carbs, uh, amino acids, essential fatty acids, minerals in the body. And you could be putting that in your body, but, you know, if you're only putting two quarts instead of the eight quarts it needs, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's quality stuff, you're not putting enough in it. Mm-hmm. And just like that Rolls Royce, you put two quarts of that amazing oil in the, in the engine and you change it every 15,000 miles, great. You put the right oil, super high quality oil in there, but it's only a matter of time before that engine starts having some problems. Yep. So I, I, I'm leaving you with this is that in your search and your quest, as you're looking at all this different fitness stuff, and you dive in deep and I, and I'll be happy to send you other links and stuff. We don't need to go in detail here, but overall is put the right stuff in your body and more specifically put the right amount, you know, mm. the right dosage, because you could be putting the right stuff in. And if you're not putting the right amount, you know, yeah. it's kind of like, you know, Hey, I put two quarts in my Rolls Royce Phantom. Why is the engine knocking? <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to leave you with that because that's, it's super important, dude. And again, you know, if you're going to race the car hot, you might need some more, uh, some more product in that, you know, you're going to burn through stuff faster. You need more in the tank. If you're, if you're going to put around town like a Prius, you may not need so much. So it's, uh, you know, there's, a uh, whatever your lifestyle and your fitness style is. Um, a lot of times I just tell people, you know, look, it's not really, uh, it's not really, you know, what you're putting in your body. It's, it's a lack of, of what you're putting in your body. Yeah. You know, and, and I laugh. When, I, uh, rest, I don't know how much you rest, but that's the complaint I get a lot from my wife is you never rest. It's because I'm impatient. It's like walk, 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 workout, workout, drum, uh, ex, uh, exercise bands. I'm, I'm just constantly moving and I don't, I never rest. And, uh, yeah. and well, you got to rest, buddy. I, I got to figure out how to do that. Rest and sleep, dude. Super <laughs> important. Yeah. And, uh, hydration, super important mineralize your body. I would recommend, uh, ionic minerals for the best absorption. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, just, um, it's really simple, you know, I mean, it, it, it's really, that that's kind of the nice thing about it is to do everything that I just said. It's, it's literally putting, uh, you know, just a, several cocktail things in, in your water every day. I make a gallon jug. Uh, I usually go through water every day, sometimes two gallons, but I will put uh, every morning I make my gallon so I know where I'm at in the day. And uh, magnesium, uh, living silica, selenium, uh, MSM, maybe a little glucosamine sometimes. Uh, the joints. Might do some ascorbic acid, you know, like vitamin C. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's like a whole cocktail of stuff. And it's, it's not like it's like you know, tablespoons and tablespoons of stuff. It's like a cap full of this, a cap full of that. It's really easy to do. Um, that's the great part about it. I'll be talking about this in the book as well. Yeah. Can't so people can, book. you know, just have a simple, simple work. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. So, all right, amigo. Well, yeah. uh, awesome talking with you, dude. It's really inspiring. I appreciate it. It gives me a boost for the week. And uh, hopefully we can check back in June and I can see uh the Incredible Hulk on the other side. Yeah, I know. I just put my fucking I, now. Now I got. Now I got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll make sure. I'm gonna have to check in. We'll get some viewers saying, "What's up? Yeah. How's his progress? How's his progress?" Yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll be posting a little stuff. I'm gonna kind of keep it under the radar as I'm, as I'm, you know. But I'll, I'll definitely be posting stuff from the gym, uh, you know, as we we get into the new year and stuff like that. And I. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm kind of into it, but yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be awesome, man. I'm really looking forward to it. And then, uh, uh, you know, summertime when the book comes out and everything like that, it's going to be, uh, it'll, it'll be cool. I think people will really, uh, get something from it because again, it's going to not just be the, the music message, but it's going to be, you know, the music and, and the benefits of, uh, of health and fitness, uh, tied into it. So life, life message. Yeah. Yep.
Yeah. You know, it'll be a, got to do it, man. Got to do it. So. Thanks, dude. All right, amigo. I appreciate it. Have fun in the sun. <laughs> What's left of it? It's getting a little yeah, overcast. I'll, be out, here, I'll but... be out in Vegas and Thanksgiving. I can't wait. Awesome. Well, hey, hit me up. If, uh, if, I, if, if it works out for us to, uh, ah, I'm going to be on the East Coast at that time. Oh. Never... Sorry. I'll be on the East Coast. <laughs> all right. All good. So, all right, brother. Bye. Well, cool, man. We'll talk soon and uh, have a good one, buddy. All right.